Spores float by, carried on an aimless breeze. The Hybrian wilds are gravid with fungus. Colorless, colored searchlights play across the clouds. They cast wild shadows, haloed in pink and green. The Hybrian wilds have devoured countless attempts at settlement. This is a forsaken place. A homestead. Settlers who live so far beyond the edge of civilization relish the hardships of solitude. They will fiercely defend their small territories, but occasionally welcome company and trade. This homestead comprises a scattering of houses and a ramshackle barn. A cloud of dust rises up from the yard. Two men are fighting. They roll on the floor, grasping for purchase and shouting complaints. The men are greying and scarred, their arms are brown as teak and knotted with muscle. They strike indiscriminately, but thus far, ineffectually. As far as you can tell, they're fighting over what colour to paint a shared outhouse. <coughs> this is nonsense, they are too old to be settling their problems this way especially out here, far from medical aid. Neither man thanks you, but they are more sulky than angry. Even on these far, lonesome rocks, men still find cause to fight. You suppose the consistency is reassuring. A cluster of islands lie in the mists. Strings of bunting flutter optimistically between them. Gervaise's rest. A travelling circus has settled here, too afraid to go further and too afraid to turn back. Its clanking, gaudy locomotive scavenges such audiences as it can from nearby homesteads and delivers them for an evening of shabby, desperate big top magic. The inconceivable circus. The greatest show. That's what the adverts promise. The reality is not impressive. Aside from the big top that dominates the circus, the place is shabby, poorly maintained, and even more poorly attended. Bored-looking circus folk man rotting booths, and the clowns painted on smiles are no match for the deep-set misery behind the grease paint. Even the calliope music, playing on a rundown piano, is more grimly resolute than cheery.
A pair of clowns whose painted on smiles do not match their actual scowls spot you almost immediately. There is nothing funny about the heavy sticks they carry. You are less than politely escorted back to the big top. Perhaps if you were better known around here, they would be less concerned. A bored urchin in a dusty top hat waits to take your money. The urchin hands over your tickets with no apparent enthusiasm. Thanks, he mutters. No one in the meager audience displays any enthusiasm, not even when the ringmaster thunders in on a horse-drawn calliope. Then come the acts themselves. Oh dear. The humiliated magician's trapdoors fail to open, leaving his glamorous assistant notably unvanished. The bereaved acrobat swings from a single trapeze, the other hangs lonely and unused. The pensive clown's fire juggling act ends in disaster and not the humorous kind. The less said about the lion tamer, the better. He sh should recover. You spend some time watching the sideshow attractions. The amazing invisible flea circus is immediately disappointing. The circus's strong woman, on the other hand, is arguably too good for the place, effortlessly raising all manner of heavy things over her head. The problem is that she makes it look so easy that the audience just shrug. It seems that the only thing she cannot lift is the mood. Back in blank, it says, followed by an indecipherable scribble. How useful. The big top looms dramatically in the fog of the reach, but it's not nearly as imposing as the massive obelisk floating nearby. Some enterprising soul has hung bunting between it and the big top. As for the circus itself, outside of the performers, it is practically deserted. You may be the first new face in the audience in quite a while. The navigator is rarely in his cabin. He's popular with the crew, and card games and drinking sessions occur spontaneously in his presence. He is, of course, never the instigator. It's important to keep an eye on the well-being of your crew, starting with your first officer. I'm settling in nicely, thank you, Captain. You've a good crew here, and a sharp one. The navigator already has visited nearly every crew member at their station.
we came across an ancient ruin wrought by long vanished hands. A new smell behind the coal and oil, the green, unlikely scent of apples. He has very little luggage. A satchel of books and a folded greatcoat appear to be his only personal effects. His manner is calm, almost pedantic, as he negotiates his duties and his pay, but you have a sense that he urgently wants to be out of Port Avon. Nobody seems to remember how long this game has been going on. It's just that the score is now almost a formality. You play your part and points are scored, yet by the time you leave it's no closer to an end. Nobody seems to mind. It is, after all, cricket. The new Somerset Hunting Club has exclusive rights to the rooms above the pub as well as its finest brandies. Thick cigar smoke curls through the air, filling this private chamber with medium-grade fog. Premium-grade fog. Bloated gentlemen in wear-worn military uniforms sit at mahogany tables, sipping port. They chunter of the old days and how very much better they were. It was a famous club in old London. Home not just to nobles and distinguished soldiers, but ex-ministers, royal courtiers, and other members of high society. A stout veteran gives you a polite once-over. Hmm, I suppose we could countenance an application. Of course, membership is not a matter of mere money. No, no. He directs your attention to the trophies. Most are old and musty. Neath creatures, deer, foxes, and a bear. All hunted in the member's now long-distant youth. Perhaps if you could decorate our walls with some impressive local fauna, we could talk of matters... <coughs> we'll try that one again. Perhaps if you could help decorate our walls with some impressive local fauna, we can talk matters of first payment and then membership. Of course, we could hunt the beasties ourselves, and we will. By thunder, we will. But the fire is so warm, and there is port left in the bottle. A short-sighted cryptozoologist. A short-sighted cryptozoologist. She perches on a stool in the corner, staring at a map of the Reach. I could have no. Must have taken a wrong connection at New Winchester. A tiny figure weighed down by two backpacks and a heavy duffel coat looks through thick glasses at her map and then up at you. 
Excuse me, I need passage. I don't suppose you could help me. I'm on the trail of unusual beasts. I can pay you for your time. Traitor's wood, beams the short-sighted cryptozoologist. She leans in conspiratorially, as it turns out, to the wrong person. They say there's all sorts living in that place, and... Oh, sorry. She turns to you. There's all sorts living in that place. Possibly even an ape man. Won't it be fun to find out? You have agreed to escort the short-sighted cryptozoologist. She almost boarded someone else's locomotive. A kindly stoker guided her the right way and onto yours. The pub is out of scrumpy. The barman blames a creature, a cross between a mushroom and a jellyfish. It sways in its seat at the bar. Who does this creature belong to? bellows a man, fuchsia with rage. The blemigan he points at is a grizzled members of its species, most of whom were left behind in the neath. The fuchsia gentleman roars in fury. Between bellows, the truth emerges. The blemigan is no one's pet, and, far worse, no one will admit responsibility for its tab. The blemigan is unconcerned with the tumult. It nods its cap at you with grim respect, then flops a tendril into a mug of stout. It stares bleakly through the window. The Blamigan is looking to sign on for one last journey. If you settle its bill, it'll join you on your locomotive. As the fuchsia gentleman inflates for a particularly prolonged diatribe about ill-mannered captains and their disorderly pets, the Blamigan climbs to the bar top to consider your face. It likes what it sees. With a sound like a shoe being pulled from a swamp, the Blamigan finishes, it drink, finishes its drink. It clambers up your arm until it reaches your shoulder from where it directs you to the door. It is experienced in surviving the cold of the heavens and the heat of those too cowardly to traverse them. It respects you. It will serve you well. Cider. Made from real apples, from the world you left behind. Careful now, a local warns you, placidly. The taste is so sweet, so appley, so heart-twangingly, breath-catchingly nostalgic that it would be easy to miss the kick. What a dangerous little beverage. You drink judici judiciously and only allow yourself one more mug. Every sip reminds you of a world that is lost. Somewhere at the far end of the universe. An incident with the repentant devil. Your newly acquired repentant devil is standing most unrepentantly over a body in the hallway. You don't recognize him. You haven't seen this person before. One of your crew, but the deceased is no one you know. A stranger on your locomotive. Peculiar luggage you brought on board, says one of the crew, when some others have gathered. Wouldn't have thought it would fit in your little bag. First, clean up. It won't do good to leave. Mm. First, clean up. It won't do to leave the body in the hall. Then your repentant devil can explain himself. He's still got the blood on his cuffs. He looks younger than most devils, but he is significantly older. His gaze blank and yellow, a wall against speculation. He grooms his sideburns artfully and knows how to be tactful with less seasoned members of the crew.
He was a stowaway, explains the devil indifferently. He's been stalking me for more than a month. I thought I'd lost him when I came aboard, then he turned up in my quarters. From the body, he has lifted a clinking bag of souls. Perhaps he was sent to bribe me rather than to kill me. He tilts his head to consider the soul collection. Apparently thinks I'm a cheap hire, if so. The devil's gaze reverts to you. I regret to say, this is probably not the last time this happens. I may be destined to attract negative attention. You spent much of your youth in the hard end of London, where the gas lamps are scarce, the prospects bleak, and the people as flinty as the cobbles. How did you like it there? The smog painted your lungs black. Your knuckles were scarred. But it was honest. There were diamonds in the dirt. I came here once. Don't remember why. A king? His cup?
The crew set about the creature with hacksaws while the quartermaster prepares a board. The hunting club will no doubt wish to replace it with something finer in mahogany or bronzewood, but this will do for the moment. A chorister corpse. The swarm is a ruin of twitching legs and broken wings. One of the bees, the sigil on its back occluded with ichor, begins its final tremulous song. The Chorister Corpse's death hymn. They say it contains secrets, if you can bear to listen all the way to the end. The sound is memorable, but not notably distressing until that high C which makes your teeth itch. Afterwards, are you wiser? Are you stronger? You are not less so. The bees died. You lived. Regent's tears, a crewman cries. The rest of the crew crowd to the windows, eager for a glance. A tremble in the air, which swells to a thunder. The repentant devil is listening to the bees. They sing of a well and the unpleasant fate of the one who gave them voices.
You near the heart of the wood, silent and solemn. The Regent's Grave. Here, at the heart of the forest, a great barrow built from ancient stone stands. Gates of star-forged bronze block the entrance. Something is whispering from the other side. The gates will not budge. The metal scrapes and screams against the rock, and your arms strain with the effort, but the gate holds fast. The whispering increases in volume from the darkness, but fades away as it becomes apparent you won't succeed. Inlaid in the metal of the gate are three hollows, the shapes of seals. You can see no signs of any such object nearby. Perhaps the station at Traitor's Wood might be a starting point. You give the order for half rations to eke out the last of your supplies. A rupture, with a groan like a dying whale, your locomotive's hull buckles. The hull cracks, the sky pours in, the cold takes you. 